Praise the Lord. Well, I'm greatly honored to be here. Let's all stand up and have a word of prayer. Praise God. Father, we come to your presence in the name of your son, Jesus, who died for us upon the cross, taking upon himself all of our sins, our shortcomings, and our diseases. Lord, we honor you this evening. We open our hearts to receive your word. We ask you to speak to us, cause us to grow and to increase in our faith and in our relationship with you, that we may bear much fruit so that you be glorified in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, now, this is going out of our live stream, right? It's okay. I'll just be careful because I'm going to show you some pictures. Uh, because I've been, you know, we do four campaigns every year in Africa. Uh, sorry, eight campaigns every year in Africa. And then we do two in a country. Uh, we do four crusades in a country in Asia where Christians are persecuted. So I just came from there, so I'm not going to mention which country it is, but you can figure that out. So let me show you some pictures of some of the campaigns. Uh, this is the last night of one of our crusades. I don't know how many people were there, but there were quite a lot. People came out to hear the gospel. And the local um, MP, uh, the member of parliament, was sitting next to me. And he told me that only 1% of this area is nominally Christian. Nominally Christian means Christian, you know, culturally Christian. That means Lutherans and Baptists and denominations and Roman Catholics with it who don't preach the gospel usually. So anyway, so this is one of our campaigns. And the next one is, uh, this is yet another one of our campaigns. And the next picture, another one of our campaigns. And the fourth one is, uh, do you have another one? Uh, yeah, there's another one of our campaigns. And these are all in one region. There's from different towns in one region. And we were in the same region right now. And uh, the f f first campaign, we were actually stopped by the police. They, they, they stopped us. So, uh, but, but they couldn't touch me because I was staying in the home of one of the members of parliament. So who was a believer? So he had me stay in his house. So that was a smart move. Instead of staying at a hotel, I stayed at his house so they couldn't touch me. Anyway, so the next picture is, uh, this is, uh, yeah, we have a church planting school. And um, we, we just graduated 23 students. And we planted 23 new churches. Uh, we, we do this every year. We have a church planting school. So in, in the same country. And the next picture is, this is my team. Uh, um, and the guy on the right, he is actually, he used to, he's American, but he's married to a local girl and he's lived there for 17 years. He used to be on my team in Africa, but now he lives there. So we kind of, you know, he, he, he works together with me now. And the next picture is uh, a few miracles. You know, this is a, a boy who was born deaf and mute began to hear and to speak uh, after the Lord touched him. And the next one is, this is a you know, young girl who was also born deaf and mute began to hear and to speak after Jesus touched her. You see, I'm wearing this cap and that jacket gives me an idea of how cold it is. Uh, it's quite cold up there, uh, especially at night. In the daytime, it's okay, but the nighttime is very cold. And the next one is uh, this. Now, this is interesting because, you know, there are no hospitals in that region. And this girl, her, her kidneys had shut down and she was dying. So her limbs were swollen because of fluid and her eyesight was gone. And, she, and her family had brought her and the Lord touched her and healed her. And she, I mean, she was weeping as she shared what the Lord had done for her. And the next one is, uh, this is, this is a little girl who was born paralyzed who walked for the first time in her life after Jesus touched her. Actually, there's a story behind this. I can tell you what happened was I was in this. Uh, now, these, these are in really remote places. So I was in this remote place and, you know, the singers were singing and I was getting ready to preach when suddenly there was a ping on my cell phone and, and it was a message from a pastor in Jakarta. He said that Reinhard Bonke has just finished his race 
and he has gone home to be with Jesus. Now, Ranat Bonke and I were very close. He was my mentor, and uh, we, have, we go back since 1987. We have been close for all these years, and, and uh, I knew that he was unwell, but I didn't realize, you know, I was not expecting him to die, and, and suddenly he dies, and uh, I can't even describe how I felt. It was like a, this grief and shock hit me. And uh, and I told my and and then at, at right then my team leader comes up. He says, Pastor, it's time for you to preach. I said, I can't preach. I, I just can't do it. Why don't you do it? He said, No, 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 Pastor, you have to preach. But, and nobody from my team wanted to preach. So anyway, I got up and preached. I, I don't remember what I said. I was so distraught. And then uh, and then immediately after that. I, I began to pray for the sick over the crowd, and this little child began to walk. And then the Lord began to speak to me. He said that the message is always greater than the messengers. Messengers come and go, but the gospel message remains, and the gospel message must keep on going forward from generation to generation. And the Lord said, Reinhardt is gone, and one day you'll also be gone, but the message will be remain, will always be there. Make sure that the next generation preaches the gospel and doesn't dilute it and doesn't stop preaching it. So that was a very defining moment for me when this miracle took place. And the next picture is, uh, this, is this, this was interesting because this woman, as you can read in the caption, she was lame, she was blind, she couldn't hear, couldn't speak was unresponsive, and she was like a vegetable. She had been like that for a long, long time, and they had brought her in a car, and the car was parked on the right-hand side of the platform about 30, 40 yards, you know, meters away. And when I began to pray for the sick, I saw the car door open, and this woman comes out walking, and she comes straight to the platform, and, and I knew something had happened, so, I was trying to talk to her, ask her what had happened. And you see the guy behind her with the, you know, the gray-haired guy with his hand up in the air? He was jumping up and down, shouting. He was kind of getting on my nerves because I was trying to talk to her. And I said, I said, who are you? And he, he said, I'm her pastor, I'm her pastor. Because <laughs> that area had very few Christians. So I said, oh, oh, I'm sorry, pastor. Uh, <laughs> so she's in your church? Yes. I said, what happened? Then he began to explain to me that she was, she was like a vegetable. There was, she was unresponsive for a long, long time, and God had touched her. And now, so she was talking, she, was, she walked, and she could see. She, I, I talked to her. It was perfectly wonderful. And this pastor was from one of those fundamentalist uh, Baptist denomination, so, so that's why, you know, so, but, but when we were finished with them, he was excited about the things of the Holy Ghost, so it was great. And the next picture was, uh, this, is a, this is a young man, now this is a very unique kind of demon possession, doesn't have any violent manifestations, but he woke up one morning and his mind was completely erased. Uh, he didn't know who he was, didn't know his own name, didn't recognize his family. Uh, when he would try to speak, you know, you only heard gibberish come out of his mouth. He didn't understand anything. It's like his mind, his hard drive had been completely erased. There was no information. There. It's a kind of demon possession. I think I've seen it three times in my life. And he was in the crowd, and Jesus touched him, and in an instant, he knew who he was, recognized everybody, he could speak. He was completely normal. And so they brought him up to share his testimony. And thank you for your enthusiasm. I know you're very excited. Uh, but uh, then the next picture is, this is a blind woman. But the reason I put this picture up is because of the man who's interpreting me. He's a Catholic priest. And the Catholics there, they love me for some reason. They, I mean, they, you know, I've had Catholic priests say to me, they say, Pastor, you plant your Pentecostal churches here, we are here to help you. You need anything, we will help you. So the first, first crusade I did in this region, we had, uh, uh, you know, we were in an area with, with no Christians. So, and you know, when you do a crusade like that, you, you need people for crowd control to, you know, to usher and to take care of things. And we had nobody. We had just our little team, and that was it. And then uh, a car drives up, and out steps a man. He says, I'm Father Thomas. 
And uh, he says, I'm, uh, I, he says, I'm saved. I'm born again. He said, I live two hours away. And the Lord woke me up and told me to, 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 to come here, that there's somebody needs help. Do you need my help? He said, yeah, we do need your help. He said, what do you need? I said, we need some people just to, just a manpower to help us. He said, oh, I'll bring people. So he brought 120 young people into buses and he, he brought young adults. So, and my team told them, you know, where to stand, what to do, what's going to happen. And everything went well. They did very well until people began to get healed. They freaked out. They went on their knees, pulled out their rosaries, and they're doing the Hail Mary. You know, they were, they were so scared. They didn't know whether this was the devil or what it was, you know. Never seen anything like it. So I suddenly realized that these people weren't saved. So anyway, so my team spent time with them the next morning. And, you know, they gave their lives to Jesus. They understood what we were doing. And on the last night, the whole bunch of them got baptized with the Holy Spirit. So, and so we have these Catholic priests, some of them, they're really, really helpful. So anyway, this is just to encourage you and show you, you know, because God is moving. Amen? Amen. Contrary to what people say, God is moving. And God is doing great things. People are getting saved, healed, delivered, baptized with the Holy Spirit. I, I just... You know, I'm coming from two campaigns, and, and we, we saw the Lord do wonderful, wonderful things. And just two months ago, I did my last crusade in Africa, and I was in Zambia, and I was in an area, they call it uh, the witchcraft capital of Zambia. And witchcraft, you know, here, if you have a troublesome mother-in-law, they say, oh, that's witchcraft, you know. But, but <laughs> we, are, <laughs> we, are, we are talking about real witchcraft. Uh, and and so, so I was I'm, I was doing this crusade, and there's this past. Well, there's this witch doctor, and he had actually killed many people through witchcraft. He just used to put a spell on people, and people would die. So many of the pastors were scared of him, uh, and uh, he. I mean, he was. They, they were, people were terrified of him, and nobody dared cross him. So anyway, I'm doing this crusade, and he shows up to the crusade. This I think. I think it was the second night he shows up. Of course, I didn't know who he was. You know, I had never seen him, never heard of him. And I had, I, they told me about him afterwards because they didn't want to bother me, you know, that there was such a man there. So he comes to the crusade and he tries, he makes four attempts to get on the platform when people were coming up and testifying that they had been healed. Uh, so he managed to get up the fourth time. So, you know, I had one after the other people coming and sharing their testimonies of what the Lord had done for them. And so he comes up and he says something in the local language and everybody laughs. And I think he was, I surmised he was trying to just make fun of us and mock us. And so everybody laughed. And, and then as he was going down from the platform, now I don't remember this, but my team leader said, he said, Pastor, as this man was leaving the platform, you turned to him and said, it's a dangerous thing to mock the Spirit of God. Well, what happened, he went home, and as soon as he reached home, he dropped dead. And the fear of God hit that town. I mean, there was a fear of God. And I mean, we got a huge crowd after that, believe me. We had masses of people who showed up and people were saved and healed. We had, we had amazing things happen. So, you know, I mean, you do have the powers of darkness, but we always have to keep this in mind that Jesus has destroyed the works of the devil. You know, for this cause was the Son of God revealed that he might destroy the works of the devil. So people... People talk, you know, we talk about magnify the Lord, not magnify the devil. To magnify means, you know, you make something bigger than it is. So we can't, we can't, we should not magnify the devil by talking about, you know, uh, what he's able to do. And we, we, we are told to magnify the Lord, but we can't really magnify him. We can't make him bigger than he is, you know. But I think we magnify him for our sake because... Uh, I think sometimes in people's minds, God isn't really as great as he is. So when we, when we magnify the Lord, it's not for God's sake to make him bigger, but to understand in our own minds uh, how big he is. And uh, if you're, and, and there's an underlying principle, if, 
If your devil is bigger than your God, you will always have problems. But if your God is bigger than your devil, you're always going to win. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, let's go to the Word of God. I'm going to read one verse for you from Zechariah 13, verse 1. And it says, uh, you know, Zechariah was the last prophet of the Old Testament. And uh, the book of Malachi comes after Zechariah, but if you look at the, you know, from the chronological point of view, Zechariah was the last prophet of the Old Covenant. And he lived and prophesied 400 years before Christ. And he makes this uh, interesting prophecy, Zechariah 13, verse 1. It says, in that day, there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And the word fountain here actually means a stream or a river, that God is going to open a stream, he's going to open a river uh, that shall be for the cleansing of sin and for unrighteousness. Now, it's interesting because in, in the days of the Bible, people had two sources of water, other than, of course, when it rained and all that, but that doesn't count because you never know when it's going to rain. But there were two sources of water. One was the well and the other was the river. The well was the place where people got drinking water, but the river or the stream, that was the place uh, where people took a bath, they went for a bath and that's where they washed their clothes. The, so the river was a place of cleansing and the well was a place of drinking. And uh, so he's saying that God is going to open a river and this river shall be special in the sense that this is not for the cleansing of the outward, outward man, but this is for the cleansing of the heart from sin. Now, interestingly, every religion, every major religion has this concept of holy rivers. Uh, if you go to India, they've got the Ganges River and the, they believe that if you dip in the Ganges River once in your lifetime, it'll somehow cleanse you from your sin. Then other religions too, they have that concept of holy water, holy river that is supposed to do something to you. Some churches, you know, they have consecrated water. You ask the priest, he'll give it and he'll give you a sprinkle because people believe that, you know, it'll cleanse you somehow. And I've had water sprinkled on me from two different religions, and I found out that the holy water, the only thing it does is to turn a dry sinner into a wet sinner. It, it doesn't do anything more than that, you know. Doesn't have any more power than that. <coughs> but God is promising that I'm going to open a stream or a river that actually has the power to cleanse your heart from sin. So I want to talk to you about that stream, about that river. Uh, and uh, that is why Jesus came to this earth. Jesus came to this earth. Now, when we talk about Jesus, because, you know, in a couple of weeks, we shall be celebrating the birth of Jesus. And uh, the birth of Jesus was very unique because, you know, going back to the Old Testament, going back to Genesis, the Bible says God created Adam, Adam and he breathed unto Adam the breath of life. And the life of God, it came into Adam's bloodstream. Now I know that because Leviticus 17 says that the life of all flesh is in the blood. You know, the life of all flesh is in the blood. So when God uh, breathed, he created Adam and he breathed into Adam, what happened was the life of God came into the bloodstream of Adam and Adam's blood carried the life of God. But when Adam and Eve sinned against God, uh, their blood got contaminated by sin. And so that gene of sin entered into the blood of Adam and that has been passed down through the generation so that every human being who is born of you can say the lineage of Adam carries that sin within his blood by default. We don't have to want it or wish it. It's just a part of our nature. Sin is a part of the human nature because our blood carries 
that sin. And David said, he says, uh, he says, in sin was I born and in sin did my mother conceive me. He, 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 he understands that, that, that we, we, you know, we carry the genes of sin in our blood. But here's the thing about the birth of Jesus. Uh, Jesus, um, you, if you remember that, you know, he didn't have a man as his father. And when, when, when a fetus or when a baby is in the womb of its mother, it's a scientific, it's a medical fact that the baby gets all kinds of nutrition through the cord. You know, it gets its humanity from its mother, but not one single drop of blood passes from the mother to the child. So Jesus... He received his humanity from Mary. He, he was in her womb for nine months. He had a body that was totally human. But the life in his blood was from God the Father. So his blood was totally pure. And that is why he was the only person qualified to, I mean, whose blood was pure, who could pay for the sins of mankind. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's why, that's why the virgin birth is so important because if there was no virgin birth, then Jesus would be just like you and me and you and I could pay for people's sins as much as he, you know, because, uh, uh, and, and there would be no salvation, nothing. But Jesus, his blood was pure. And as he was growing up, the Bible tells us that Satan tried to do to him what he did to Adam, to contaminate his blood with sin. And it says that Jesus was tempted in every way, but without sin. Now, that, that is important for us to consider because, you know, we, we talk about temptation and we are all tempted in different areas. And there are certain areas in which I am tempted, uh, but which are not areas of temptation for you. And that's why it's easy for us to judge one another, when we see a, a brother fall into sin, we say, how could he do that? I would never do that. You're right, you would never do it because that's not an area where you are tempted, but that's an area where he's tempted and, and vice versa. But the one thing about Jesus, because of which he understands all of us, he has been where we are is because he is the only one who has been tempted in every single area but without sin. And so Jesus, uh, you know, you can see how Satan tried to contaminate his blood with sin, and, but, but, but he couldn't because he was without sin. And it was without sin that he came to the Garden of Gethsemane. He was about 33 years old at that time. He, uh, you know, he started his ministry at about 30. He lived, he lived in, in obscurity. Uh, in, in the sense that he was not famous in any way. He was not a celebrity. He lived with his, you know, his mom and uh, uh, he worked as a carpenter and then he came to the river Jordan and when he was baptized, the Holy Ghost came on him and a voice came from heaven and said, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. So that was the first uh, loud and vocal affirmation from God that this is my son and the second thing, that I'm pleased with him. He, you know, Jesus is my son, plus I am well pleased with him because you know, he, he had lived a holy and perfect and sinless life. And that's when he began his ministry. And we read about his ministry, how he preached the gospel, how he fed the hungry, he cleansed the lepers, he healed the sick, he raised the dead, he did miracles and all that. And that went on for three and a half years. And then at the end of those three and a half years, he comes to this place called the Garden of Gethsemane. And when he comes to the Garden of Gethsemane, he, he, uh, we read about him as he's praying, and then the Father shows him this cup and tells him, Jesus, it is for this reason that I have sent you to this world to drink of every drop that is in this cup. And that cup contained the sins of all mankind. And uh, you can't even imagine, uh, it's, it wasn't just my sins in that cup and your sins in that cup, but the sins of the entirety of mankind. Right now, there's eight billion people on this earth. And uh, somebody did some calculations and uh, said that from Adam until now, 
uh, there have been about, uh, uh, about um, 39 billion people on this earth. And, and it'll multiply, you know, it'll multiply rapidly. And so, and we don't know when Jesus will come back. So by the time Jesus comes back, there'll be multiplied billions of human beings who have lived on this planet. So you can think of the compounded sins of uh, the billions and billions of people. And a billion is a, is a thousand million. I mean, you, uh, the numbers are astronomical. And all of our sins, when I say our sins, I'm including the entirety of mankind. All of our sins, our big sins, our little sins, our open sins, then we have got secret sins that are so dark, we don't want anybody else to find out about them. And we all have those things. We have all done things, thought things, and that we are ashamed of, and we have received forgiveness of, from God. But you think of all the sins of mankind, the sins of uh, ordinary people, the sins of the most evil people who have lived on this earth, the, the, the worst scum of humanity. Jesus saw all that in that cup. And the father said to him, Jesus, this is why you have come to this world to drink of this. And, uh, and Jesus was so pure and he knew what it would cost him. Because if he drank of that cup and partook of the sins of mankind, uh, the father would turn his face away from him. That was the worst scenario for him because he had always had perfect communion with his father. He was one with his father and he knew, he knew that the father would reject him and the father would turn his face away from him and that he would be cursed. And so that's why he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass me by. In other words, Lord, I know I have come to this earth for this. But if there's any other way to do it, let's do it that way. But then that was his instinct of self-preservation. But he had another instinct that was greater than his instinct of self-preservation. And that was his love for sinners. Just think that at that moment, he loved you and me more than he loved himself. And that's when he said, but nevertheless, not mine, but your will be done. And then when he made that decision, his soul came into uh, deep anguish. And the Bible says he began to sweat drops of blood. And that was the first time we see his precious blood flow from his body. He began to sweat drops of blood and angels came to minister to him. After that, they arrested him and took him to Pilate and... Uh, I read all the happenings there, and the Pilate and Pilate Pontius Pilate gave him to the soldiers, and the soldiers stripped him of his robes and they tied him up. Now the Romans used to have a an instrument of torture known as a flagrum. A flagrum was a whip with nine long belts of leather, and each belt of leather was covered with sharp barbs of metal and bone and uh, I mean the thing was designed to actually it killed people Man, many people couldn't survive a, a, you know a solid whipping with a flag room but they began to whip Jesus and with each cut of the whip his back was torn open pieces of skin and flesh were torn off his back and his blood began to flow they whipped him so much that the psalmist says that plowmen have plowed my back and I made long furrows. His back looked like a field that had been plowed and his blood flowed from his wounds. And the Bible tells us exactly why he went through that whipping. And it says, surely, that's what the prophet Isaiah says, surely he has borne our diseases and he has carried our pains. And by his stripes, those stripes on his back, we have been healed. And that is why it is so important for us to preach healing. I, I always, I, you know, like when I was in a, you know, doing our crusades this time, that's what they told us. They said, you can preach about your Jesus, but don't talk about healing. Don't, don't heal the sick. I said, well, it's in the gospel. And if we don't pray for the sick, it, that'll be disobedience unto God. And the main reason we pray for the sick is simple. 
because of the immensity of the price that Jesus paid so that people can be healed. He paid such a price for people to be healed. How can we be quiet about it? That is why we pray for the sick because if you look at the magnitude of the sufferings of Christ so that people can be healed, it's not, it's not a blessing that came cheap that, that you know, God didn't say, well, salvation is the main thing and by the way, I'm, you know, I, I will sprinkle some healing here and there. He didn't do that. He paid a terrible price for every human being to be healed and that is why I mean, every human being who is sick, we should be telling them, listen, Jesus bore your diseases and carried your pains and by his stripes you are healed. Now, that also answers a question, why don't we see more miracles? Well, because we don't preach it that much. Because what, you know, what God does is always connected to our preaching. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the words of God. But the things that we preach are the things that God is going to do. So there's a lot of responsibility that comes on our shoulders. We have to preach it and preach it and preach it and preach it. And the things we preach are the things that God will do. So anyway, so that's why he was being whipped. He bore all our physical and, and these days, especially with this big issue we have of mental and emotional diseases. And Jesus bore all of them. He bore all our diseases. He carried all our pains, physical, mental, emotional. And the Bible says that by his stripes, we have been healed. By his wounds, there's, there's a remedy for everybody. Everybody can be healed. Hallelujah. After they whipped him, then they crowned him with a crown of thorns. Now, th thorns are symbolic of the curse that is on mankind because of sin. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, God cursed the earth. And he said, from now on, the earth shall bring forth thorns and thistles. And that day when Jesus wore that crown of thorns, that was the time he became a curse for us. Galatians 3 says that Christ has become a curse for us. Jesus bore the curses that were upon us. <coughs> that means that we as Christians, we should never fear curses. Never. Curses can never touch you. They can never affect you. Do you understand what I'm saying? People talk about generational curses. Do I believe in generational curses? Yes, I believe it. They're in the Bible but they're not for the believer. Generational curses are for the unbelievers. For the believers, there are generational blessings. The Bible says that the children of the upright shall be blessed and that the blessings of the Lord, his covenant is with us and for our children and our children's children. So uh, you should never as a believer go around asking for prayers because somebody has put a curse on you because curses were broken by Jesus when he became a curse for us, when he wore that crown of thorns for us. So that's why he wore the crown of thorns. And after that, they began to beat him. Isaiah 52 says that his face was disfigured beyond recognition. They took sticks and bars and they beat him. And his face was disfigured. And the Bible says he was beaten so that we might be peace. We might have peace. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. It says in the King James, Jesus was beaten so that we might have peace. Uh, peace with God. Peace in our own hearts. Just think of it. Peace with God. Peace in our own hearts. Peace with our fellow man peace, that we might have peace. And so he was beaten that we might have peace. And then there he stood. They spat upon him, mocked him, and cursed him. Covered, he stood there covered with his own blood. Covered with the spit of sinners and covered with dirt. And they made him carry that cross to Calvary where they laid him on the cross and they took those long iron nails and nailed him to the cross through his hands and his feet and then they hung him on that cross for six hours. And when he was on the cross for six hours under excruciating pain, 
That was the time God was putting our sins upon him. God was settling our accounts. Your sins, my sins were being put upon Jesus. And as our sins were being put upon him, taken off us and put on him, his blood flowed from his wounds, paying for the price for our sins. But you know, here's an astounding fact that I thought of it when I was, I was, I was thinking of these things. You know, a human body, if you look at Jesus, I, I mean, Jesus was uh, uh, physically, physically, he was an ordinary human being about our height, right? I mean, he wasn't like extra tall or big. He was, he looked like a regular human being. He was about my size or your size. And a regular human being carries about five liters of blood in his body. Five liters of blood. So the body of Jesus, Jesus had about five liters of blood. Now think of it. Every year in the temple, thousands of animals were sacrificed to atone for the sins of the people. There was the annual sacrifice. And there were all these other sacrifices for other infractions or, you know, go, if you do this, go to the temple, make a sacrifice. Then there was, so, you know, the temple in Jerusalem was a very bloody place. If you walked in there, you... You, it smelled like a slaughterhouse. You, you smelled the smell of blood. Tens of thousands of liters of blood flowed in the temple. And it was done year after year and on a daily basis. There were all the sacrifices. And yet that blood was from animals that were without blemish because you didn't just didn't bring any animal into the temple to be sacrificed. It had to be without blemish, no teeth missing, no patches where the fur was missing. It had to be perfect, perfect animals, tens of thousands of liters of blood. And they would only cover, not wash away, cover people's sins and infractions. And they had to do the same thing every year, all the time. But when it came time for God to send his son into the world to deal with the sins, not just of the Jews, because the Jews were a limited number of people. And whatever happened in the temple was for the Jews. But to take away, not just cover, but to take away and wipe away the sins of billions of human beings. God only sent five liters of blood. You can imagine how powerful, how holy that blood is, the blood of Jesus. That blood is so holy that it can take away and wipe away the sins of all mankind. Hallelujah. So here comes Jesus with the most precious five liters of any substance on this earth. He comes with his blood, hallelujah. And he sheds his blood upon the cross. And then when he dies, after six hours on the cross, one of the soldiers comes and puts his spear between his ribs and water and blood flows out of his wound and, and all the blood flows from his wounds and it runs down the cross and it collects in a pool at the foot of the cross and a little stream of blood begins to flow down that hill. And that was the day God kept his promise. He opened a stream or a river of blood. It's not a river of water, but it's a tiny stream of blood. But that little stream of blood is more than enough to clean all of us 
and all of mankind from all of our sins and diseases and from everything else. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. So that was the day that river was opened, that river of blood. And that river still flows today. It's interesting. You see, if I make a little incision on my finger and let a couple of drops of blood drop on the ground, you come back a few hours later, all you will have left is a, a few dark stains. But the blood of Jesus is as pure, is as fresh, as, as warm today as it was 2,000 years ago. Because the Bible says we have not been bought by corruptible things. Corruptible things are things that can lose their freshness, that can lose their shine, that can tarnish, that can go stale. We have not been bought by corruptible things like silver and gold, but we have been purchased by the precious blood of Jesus. Blood that is still warm and fresh today and that can still cleanse sinners even today, as it has done for the past 2,000 years. We have been purchased by that kind of blood. So there's several things about the blood of Jesus. The, the first thing about the blood of Jesus that I want to share with you, that the blood of Jesus is saving blood. It is blood that cleanses and saves. Ephesians 1, 7, it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. We have redemption through his blood. You know what redemption means? Redemption means when, when you, you know, there's many ways of looking at it. One way of looking at it is when you go to a shop and you see something you like and you pay a deposit and then they lay it aside for you with your name on it, and then you come back a few days later and you pay the full price, then you redeem that which is yours. So the Bible says that we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. We have been purchased by the blood of Jesus. Not only have we been cleansed, but Jesus has purchased us. We belong to him. We don't belong to the devil anymore. Through that blood, we have redemption. Hallelujah. The second thing, the blood of Jesus is healing blood. Isaiah 53, 5 says, by his wounds, by his stripes, we have been healed. Because of the blood that flowed from his wounds, we have been healed. The blood of Jesus is saving blood, but the blood of Jesus is also healing blood. The third thing, the blood of Jesus brings deliverance. Colossians 2, verse 15, it says, Having disarmed the powers and principalities arrayed against us, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So at the cross, Jesus won a total and decisive victory over the devil. Jesus won a total victory over Satan. Satan was defeated at the cross. The fourth thing, the blood of Jesus brings down the fire of God. You know, in the Old Testament, we read time again how the fire of God fell, how the fire of God fell, how the fire of God fell. The interesting thing is that the fire never fell on a dry altar. The fire only fell on a blood-soaked altar. So the blood always brings down the glory. You know, in Africa, we have seen up to 30,000 people at one time getting baptized with the Holy Spirit. And the Lord told me that if you want people to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, always preach on the blood of Jesus because the blood will always call down the fire. Every time I preach on the blood of Jesus, the Holy Ghost falls. Every time. See, up to 30,000 people baptized with the Holy Spirit at one time. Because God always responds to blood with fire. The glory of God always comes down when we lift up the blood of Jesus. 
Then the fifth thing is that the blood of Jesus speaks for us at the altar of God. Because when Jesus ascended to heaven, sat at the right, right hand of the Father, he took his blood with him. And he put it upon the altar. And it says, Hebrews 12, 24, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than, than that of Abel. So the blood speaks for us. When Cain shed his brother Abel's blood, Abel's blood cried out to God for revenge. But the blood of Jesus speaks mercy, speaks salvation, speaks forgiveness, speaks healing over you and me. The blood of Jesus speaks. The blood of Jesus speaks for you and for me. Then the next point is that the blood of Jesus is the blood of sprinkling that separates us unto God. In 1 Peter 1, 2, it talks about that we are called to be sprinkled by the blood of Jesus. And that actually means that in the Old Testament, whenever they brought in vessels that were going to be designated for God's use alone, they would sprinkle the vessels with the blood. So once the blood was sprinkled on a vessel, everybody understood that this vessel will only be used for ministering unto the Lord. It will not be used for anything else. And that is why when we are sprinkled by the blood of Jesus, we are for God's use alone. That is why it is so important because we live in an age when there's so much of compromise even within Christians. They, we live in an, in an area and, and we rationalize away that compromise. People compromise with the world. People don't live holy anymore. People, you know, I mean, they pay lip service to God. We are Christians. Then they say, well, we have to be a light. Well, be a light then if you're going to be a light. If you're going to be as dark as they are, there's no light there. Don't live a life of compromise. Don't try to be like people in the world because you're sprinkled with blood and you're for God's use alone. Amen. There's no compromise because only when, you, when you're sprinkled with the blood of Jesus, you're saying, you know what? I belong to Jesus and to him alone. And the last thing is that the blood of Jesus gives us access to the presence of God. And in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verses 19 to 20, it says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, through the blood of Jesus, we have access to the presence of God himself. There's only one way to come to the presence of God, and that is through the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus has made a way for you and me to come to the presence of God. Not just experience his presence. Not just like, you know, you can go to a worship service and the singing is good, lights are dim, and you can say, I felt the presence of God. No, this is not about feeling the presence of God. This is entering into the presence of God where you can have communion with the Father. You know, people in the Old Testament, you know, to enter into the presence of God was a big thing. I mean, it was only the high priest and he could go in there once a year with the sacrifices of people. And when he used to go in, they used to tie a rope around his ankle because if God did not accept the sacrifice, he would be knocked dead. And they used to drag his body out and that was the end of it. But we, because of the blood of Jesus, we have the right to come to God's presence anytime of the day and night, as many times and whenever we want to. And this is something we have to make use of. 
come to God's presence every day. When you are home, say, Father, I enter into your presence through the precious blood of Jesus. I come to you now. And then you enter into the presence of God and begin to talk to God. Begin to talk to God about what's on your heart. If you have got issues in your life, in your family, uh, even at your work, or talk, to, talk to the Father about it. He's right there. You are right there in your presence. You have the right to go there and talk to him. Talk to him. If you've got things you're struggling with, talk to him. You've got health issues. You've got financial issues. Issues with your kids. Talk to God. Hallelujah. We have that access. And there's no limit to it. It's not just once a year like the high priest in the Old Testament. But we have the right to come to the presence of God. Anytime. Through the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That precious blood, there was only five liters of it, but it's more than enough for you and me. Everything we need is available to us through the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.